get pop up after staying on the interstate for an hour and a half, knowing that the restroom was calling my name. And I do apologize for, oh my goodness, but you know how it is. I guess there was, might have been a fatality accident there in Julie County. I also had to bring my son today because he's also sick, and uh, I did not have a babysitter this morning. I left my house around 5 o'clock. This morning. I live I live north of Atlanta, so driving down here. But you know, to me, I used to work Georgia Conservancy, and I would travel the entire state. So for me to get to Jekyll Island was a six-hour drive. So the way I gauge things, if it's less than six hours, it's doable. It's okay. So to come down here, it's a piece of cake. And uh, so I do, no longer do work for the Georgia Conservancy, where I did education. Now I'm back in a classroom. I teach K-5. I am the science teacher for the entire school, so I have 1,000 students. Wow. Don't ask me all their names, because even this late in the year, I still don't know all of their names. And it's terrible, the ones I know are not the ones that are the best behaved. <laughs> but this is a subject I am very, very passionate about. I have been uh, one of the steering committee members for Monarchs Across Georgia, which some of you may be very familiar with. And it's more than just about Monarchs. And that's why today you can see my presentation. Oh my goodness, I completely, I should have changed my, the name of it. Because I no longer like to say that we butterfly garden. We actually pollinator gardens because everybody comes to visit. If there's nectar there, they're coming. I also have uh, bees. Um, this year, we had bears come and attack two of our bees. I, I may have to occasionally tell him to, to um, tone it down a bit. Daniel, Daniel, turn on quiet. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, and so two of our hives were taken out by bears which I found quite interesting, but you realize even a male bear needs 45 square acres, or 45 square miles of habitat, so no wonder they're coming into people's neighborhoods. Okay, as we get started, I, I, was, I was saying at the beginning, I was telling Amy, I said, this is a subject that I do 10-hour workshops for teachers. I promise I'm not going to keep y'all here for 10 hours, um, but you know what, this is one of those, you're going to have to watch the clock and probably say, woo, time is up, our stomachs are hungry, and it's time to go eat. Like I said, it is something I am very passionate about. Now, when we get started with this, there are some reasons that we should be doing this. And to me, one of the biggest is because of habitat destruction. In Georgia, at one time, we were losing about 45 acres of um, land per day to development. That's starting to pick back up again as the economy has switched. And I no longer just say habitat destruction, I also say degradation as well because we have things like acid rain that will destroy. We also have other things like litter that will destroy um, places where the, the uh, plants and animals live as well. One of the biggest reasons I think we like to garden, many of us, is because the enjoyment that we get out of it. The, uh, the opportunity to sit there and be able to see the fruits of your labor, especially with butterfly gardening or pollinator gardening. When you can sit there at the end of the day, and I'd be able to watch the butterflies come in. And that's what I love about this, because not only are they coming to visit the nectar plants, what they're also doing, you can see some in the early morning are coming to bass, because they have to raise those temperatures up to about 80 degrees before they can fly. We can also see them going from plant to plant as they're nectaring. They will even, they are, some species are even territorial, and will even fight each other for that particular space in your garden. So you get to see things like that. Who needs television? Go outside, sit there by the garden, and you start to see all of these things start to happen. And so many times I think that's what the problem is, is that we don't really use our observation skills. If I was to sit here even now and say, oh, I want you to draw you know, a particular part of your garden on a piece of paper, and if I went to your garden, I would want it to be so wonderfully drawn that I could pick out the place that you had drawn. But we, we, we don't take the time, though, too many times to look at things in that level of detail. And as you do, you may start to see all kinds of interactions going on in that garden besides the butterflies. Things like the ladybugs, things like you know the praying mantis that are there. All these sorts of things are going on. And of course, just to enjoy. So that's why I always say, you know, bring out your binoculars as well when you're sitting there in, in your chair. And um, I always like to uh, tell people that this is my garden, <laughs> but that's not true. <laughs> but y'all have, I would, right now, this is so bad, I wouldn't even invite anybody to my garden. My husband is so mortified. He says, you help everybody else with your garden, but then our, ours looks terrible. I promise this summer I'm going to work because what's going to happen? What happens is I buy all the lovely plants, 
I line them, I line the driveway with the containers. I'm on plant restriction right now. I can no longer buy any more plants until I get those planted. <laughs> and then the other thing that happened is I bought my house in 1989. Our garden has changed through the years. It is now becoming more and more shade. And so I'm having to learn and adjust to that as well. Because I really don't want to cut down so many more trees. A couple are going to have to go because of the amount of shade. But that's something you do need to keep in mind as you are gardening. What's your one-year plan, your five-year plan, your 10-year plan? Many times, I'm just a matter of just getting the thing in the ground and years later having to go back and rearrange my garden all over again. But the reason I have this picture of this garden up here is because this does show a really good pollinator garden. It is in full sun. It has layers that are there, and it has a variety of um, nectar plants. Um, it's not just for butterflies here. Now, the one thing that is missing is the water source. But we're going to talk about some of these things. But before I do that, I want you to get to know butterflies all about. They're, they're, they're very interesting little critters. And so I love kids' art, artwork, as you can tell here on the bottom. Now, of course, they go through metamorphosis. <laughs> And um, one thing is, when you're out gardening, stop and, like I said, really look. And this is some of the things you'll find. Now, many of these are about the size of a pinhead. So you may have to get a magnifying glass as you look for these things. But um, butterfly eggs will be on the underneath side of the, um, the leaf. Again, that's because of, um, you know, it's a safety issue because they can't run away. So mama, you know, places that egg underneath. You'll see her as she's flying around. Butterflies taste with their feet. And they can also smell with their antenna. They can smell nectar flowers about half a mile away. So they come up and all, so they land on that particular host plant. Some species only have one host plant that they will uh, lay their eggs on. As she comes up, she will take and she will place for her, um, she will place, oh, I'm sorry, I keep blocking that too. And she will lay the egg with uh, a little sticky drop and she'll lay it right underneath the leaf. Some will lay in clusters. Some will only wait, lay one egg per leaf, which tells you why you need quite a, a few host plants. So you can see they come in a variety of sizes, or excuse me, shapes. It could be turban, it could be round, they could be oblong. There are also very many different colors as well as you can see. So learning to identify that egg stage is also very important. But as we garden, if you really do want to attract your pollinators, it's very important that you do include those host plants as well, which we'll talk about a bit, uh, bit more here at the end. So after about, um, after about three to seven days, depending on the species and also the temperature, that egg, that egg will hatch and out will come the little caterpillar. The very first thing that most of them do is they turn around and they will eat their eggshell because they use that as a protein source. Now you can see here that this one, um, it's kind of hard to judge the size of it, but just think about this. After they eat the eggshell, their mouths are so small that the, they can only eat the leaves on the, the, or excuse me, the hairs on the leaf. Mm -hmm. Only the hair. That's how small. But so they do start to grow very, very quickly. This process will take, depending on species, could take anywhere from 14 to 21 days. And as they eat, of course, you know, as an insect, they have their skeleton on the outside. They have an exoskeleton. So they eat, 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 eat. And they'll stop and you'll think, oh my gosh, they're sleeping or something. Actually, in their brains, they have a very special chemical that they release down into their body. They, they don't breathe through a mouth like we do. They have little holes down their sides. They will breathe in that air that, you, that chemicals actually help uh, release or soften the skin. And when they breathe in the air, it's like a balloon. That, that skin will pop. They will wiggle out of that skin. And many times they turn around and they'll eat their old skin as well, which is a protein source. And so, and then that skin is still very soft. They need to rest for it to harden, and then they will begin to eat again. If you can imagine a, a child who probably weighs 50 pounds in three days' time weighing as much as a school bus, that's about how quickly and how much a caterpillar grows during this time. Their whole job is to do nothing, eat, grow, eat, grow, eat, grow. And depending on which species, again, um, those periods of rest in between are called instars. They can go between anywhere from five to eight instars, again, depending on the species. But you know what, during this time too, I love, I think it's fascinating to watch this. So I encourage people, bring them into your house, watch this process, and uh, make sure you have plenty of host plant though, if you do decide to harvest some caterpillars and bring them in and watch. And you need to make sure, you know, like with anything, if you eat, you have to go to the bathroom, and butterfly poop is called frass. 
Make sure you're cleaning your cage daily because you don't want them, you know, get, to get, you know, bacterial infection or some other type of infection and die because your whole job is trying to, to raise and release and enjoy these. So as they start to eat, well, here's some of the different larvas that we have here. Now, our Georgia State <coughs> butterfly is the tiger swallowtail. But as you can see here, there's two different pictures for that one because what happens is when it is, when it is first born, it looks like, does that remind y'all of anything? Bird poop, doesn't it? Looks like bird scat up there. And it's a way, of course, to camouflage itself. It will, it will remain there for probably through the first three instars. And then the fourth instar, it then, actually if I had a better picture of the two eyes that were there, it looks like a snake when it rears up like this. So you had a bird coming in trying to get it. It would raise that head with these two big yellow eyes and would look like a snake and scare that bird away. Gulf fritillaries, they look very vicious. They look like, oh, if I touch that, it's going to sting me. That's not true. Again, it's just one of those amazing adaptations that they have uh, for protection. And then, of course, I love like our black swallowtails. If you've ever picked one up and you're holding one, it'll stick out these two yellow things that are called osmotarium. And I always tell the kids, I'm like, oh, smell it. Smell. I've already smelled, so I'm not smelling it again. But if you've never smelled it, it does, doesn't it? It stinks. Oh my goodness. But that's protection for them as well. So if you have not smelled it, I would just suggest you just take a little sniff and then you'll never want to smell them again either. We go ahead and do that. So these are just a couple of the different ones we have. Now in Georgia, total in, the, in North America, we have 750 different species of butterflies. Georgia, we have 160 that live here. A really good gardener, you could probably attract about 30 of those species to come to your garden and lay their eggs and to nectar. Because some of them, are, like I said, are so specific to the host plant that they need. You know, if you wanted to plant, if you wanted to, um, you know, grow something, or excuse me, attract something like a giant, uh, you see a big, I'm trying to remember the name now, completely left me. Oh, I hate when I do this. This was my day yesterday. Oh, a hair streak, a purple hair streak. You would need mistletoe growing in your yard. I don't have mistletoe, so I know that would be one that would be off my list. Also, if you wanted to grow some, if you wanted to attract something like a hessy for uh, hair streak, you would need to have a white oak swamp. I don't know how many of you have a white oak swamp, but that would also be a very difficult one for you to attract. But you know, but to have 30 would be fantastic, but even if it's just four or five that you're growing host plant and attracting is also a fantastic thing to have. Now, of course, this is all the different instars that you see there. And many times I tell, it's like hold up your pinky finger. When that first instar would be about half the size of your pinky finger nail. By the time it reaches that fifth instar, it's going to be about the size of your pinky. That's how much, um, you know, eating and growing, eating and growing that is going on here. So and it's actually something like a monarch takes about 32 um, good sized leaves. Uh, to be able, that's with uh, common milkweed, to be able to reach adulthood there. So you can see it's a quite a bit of food that they are eating. Then we have the different pupa that are here. And there's two different ways that pupa can attach themselves. Now this is one we cannot interchange words. We can call larva caterpillar, caterpillar larva, but we cannot call that poop a uh, poopa. That pu <laughs> I have scat on my brain today too, don't I? You can't call that pupa a cocoon because butterflies make a chrysalis. Those two words are not interchangeable. A cocoon and a chrysalis is not. Moths make cocoons, butterflies make a chrysalis. So here we can see the one that is on um, is on your left. That is one where they would that one would attach itself. Let's say um, like a little seat belt. You have like a tiger, like a black swallowtail. It almost looks like they have a little seat belt here that they wrap around and attach onto whatever that stem. It could be a branch. And I, I, you know what, I've been so curious to know how far will a caterpillar actually go to pupate. One year I had a stand of milk weed that was there and I saw one of my monarchs that had traveled probably about 20 feet heading towards my <coughs> woods, which were another 30 feet away. And I was just curious to know, was it traveling to the woods? It's very difficult for you to find chrysalis because at this stage they are very vulnerable to predation. And so that's why they want to make sure that they're very well hidden and they will crawl away from that source. 
So here we have what starts off, especially with monarchs. I'm going to probably um, do a lot of examples with them today just because of the group monarchs across Georgia that I'm a part of. Now what happens is you bring one of these in and watch this, it's fascinating. Underneath their chin, they have a little silk pad. And you'll notice they'll crawl up to the top and their head will start doing this number as they're making that little silk pad on there. Then what they'll do is they will take and they have little claspers that are near where, um, where their, their tail, the end of them. And they'll grab onto that and they stick something up called a cream master. Now, what's happening, that chemical is releasing itself in, from their brain again, loosening that skin, goes down, and you'll notice it makes a letter J. Now, this is going to take a while here. You'll notice that the antenna are not limp. They're still pretty rigid. So you've got some time, you have a couple of hours, you know, before this is actually going to go ahead and split out of that skin. When you start to notice that those antenna go limp, I tell everyone, don't leave. Don't leave because it's like magical. Because that's when that skin is going to split open and you'll get to see them wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. As they're wiggling, wiggling, wiggling out of that old skin, they wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. Then the old skin is going to end up at the top. They will actually release and let that um, old skin drop because there can be parasites and things that can be attached to that and they don't want to harm that chrysalis. Now, the chrysalis is clear, but what you're looking at is the caterpillar that's inside of it. That is the green color. They go through what is called um, histogenesis. That means all their cells completely break down. It's like a soup inside. If you've ever broken open a chrysalis or accidentally had one fall and break open, you'll see it's just a ooze. It's just goo inside of it. And so all of those cells are breaking down, rearranging themselves, and this can take anywhere from about seven, uh, seven to 10 days, again, depending on the species that you have. Now, something with monarchs is scientists aren't even completely sure why that gold, that black ring is there. They scraped it off and it actually killed, it killed the, um, the insect. So they're not sure what it does. But then what happens is the last 24 hours is when the color the, in the pigment, um, the pigments in the wings actually form at this time. So you know within 24 hours that your butterfly is going to emerge. And so that is a time, if you have brought it in, don't shake the cage when it starts to come out. Because as it comes out, it's very wet. And um, if it falls to, the, falls to the bottom of that container, its wings are going to dry crumpled like that. So you, that's when you just stand back and you just watch and you just do it all because it is so cool to see this. Um, this past um, fall, I had an opportunity to raise monarchs with my students, which were released on their way to Mexico. And all of those, and one of the kids did bump the container and it fell and the wing was crumpled. You know, it, it's just one of those things that happens, unfortunately. Now, when it does come out, its abdomen will be completely full of fluid at this time. I don't know where I need to sit, maybe further away from there. Completely full of ab, um, fluid. So its wings are all crumpled and wet, so it has to take that fluid and pump it out, pump it out, pump it out. That will take several hours for this to happen. And then the wings need to also dry. You'll notice that your butterfly will just kind of just hang there um, as it's starting to dry. If, if you are raising them, if, it, if, they, uh, if this happened in the morning, you can release it that afternoon. If it happened in the evening, I'd probably wait till the next morning to release until it's warm enough for them. And um, there's a couple of things that you can do though for them. If you notice that you have a butterfly that has difficulty eating, you know, they use their proboscis, you can actually help them out. What happens is when they come out, their proboscis is like a zipper. The two pieces have to zip together and then it curls back up just like one of those party, balloon, uh, party blowers. If you notice yours is not uncurled, this is what you ready for what you can do. Some people say, I can't do that. Oh, you can, it's easy. You're gonna, you grab the, the four wings of the butterfly. You take a, a stick pin, that, like a, what you would sew with, you know, just a regular pin. And what you would do is you put it right in that proboscis and you carefully uncurl it. You're helping it zip that, that proboscis back. But you're thinking, oh my goodness, what happens to all the ones in nature that this doesn't have, you know, that doesn't have a person there to help them. Unfortunately, those would not make it. I've had two that I've had to do that for. And it is very easy, just a matter of holding and just gently pulling it in. You don't tear? You don't tear it. That's the beautiful thing. Butterflies are hardier than people think they are. You can hold them. 
And if some of the scales come off, that is okay because that's what they were made to do. Um, and monarchs are one that if any of you work with any garden clubs with children, it's one of the hardiest butterflies to work with. And, uh, and like I said, when you're holding it and you have those four wings, the wings are not going back and forth where it can injure itself. And you put that, the, the pin gently within, this will be like a little circle there. You're just putting it in the circle and just gently pulling it out. It's easier, I know, it's easier than what it sounds like. You're like, oh my goodness, I'm, you know, I'm going to hurt this butterfly. Here are a couple of the butterflies that we have in Georgia. To me, some of the, um, the, uh, the swallowtails are some of the most difficult to identify as they are flying. Butterflies fly 12 miles an hour, so sometimes it's rather difficult. And plus, you have to look at the, the, um, the wings on top and the wings on the bottom oftentimes are different colors. So learning to identify, like I said, can be difficult. Um, Things like, let's see, what do I have here? You can look at the, the swallowtail here with each of those, and you just see a slight coloration between the male and the female, where the male has, or the, excuse me, the female has that yellow marking and the male doesn't. But there's several, several others. You've got a red spotted purple that looks very similar as well. So a very good, we're lucky here in Georgia, we do have a book. It is, uh, you know, Butterflies of Georgia is one of the best ones out there for identifying your butterflies. It's a good one. And look here with our state butterfly. So many times people just see the yellow and they say, oh yeah, there's just a swallowtail. Not realizing every single one of these is a tiger swallowtail. Again, look at the difference between the male and the female. This time she has the blue markings down on those hind wings. So very confusing, but females come in two different morphs here. Primarily, um, I was gonna say, actually I've seen both quite often. And so again, it's just learning to identify can be very confusing for some folks. Oops, I keep pushing the wrong button. I'm not going to go through the whole body thing here. Look, you can't get parasites in there. That was an actual picture from my garden, the bottom one, a wasp that oftentimes a wasp will bore in and then eat. Okay, uh, of course with butterflies, we're studying about Lepidoptera. What I think is interesting, an easy way for you to identify, because people say, well, moths come out at night, butterflies are in the daytime. Now, we have some wonderful species of moths that do come out in the daytime as well. And they'll say, well, the butterflies are the pretty ones and the moths are the kind of drab ones. No, we have some beautiful moths as well. <laughs> think about, oh my gosh, um, like a, uh, oh my God, why is my brain fried? Luna moth. You know, look how beautiful the colors are on that Luna moth that we have. So we look at the, um, the antenna. You can see butterflies are clubbed. We have moths that are feathery, but then we have a second group here, or excuse me, third group, a skipper. They kind of go up and they hook back down. And what a skipper does, many times people confuse them for a moth because they kind of have that uh, powdery look to them, but they come out in the daytime and when they fly, it's kind of like they're skipping along in your garden. So you'll notice that they're flying, it's kind of like this. So that's the difference between those. There's the proboscis I was talking about. So see, take the pin, put it in the little right here, and just gently just uncurl it, and you'll be good to go. And the scales, like I said, you can hold them. Some of the scales, they're made to come off, like if they got caught in a, in a spider web, um, you know, some of them would come off. But the, the scales are used for helping them fly. They do help them with protection. They do help with body warmth. They do help as they're mating, you know, for identification. And uh, so, but they're made to come off. Okay, so now that was a little bit just about the, just the, um, the biology of, of, of butterflies. Now we get to this, uh, start talking about the gardening portion. How many of you already have a butterfly garden? Oh, I bet every single one of you has something that comes to your yard. So I bet you all can raise your hand. Something comes to your yard. You occasionally see butter, but you don't have what you would call a designated place. Well, sometimes I come at our new garden programs and some people will say, well, I don't have a sunny place. What can I do? There's still hope for you, even if you have a shady place. But what they have found in doing experiments is that with the plants, they planted some in the bright, wonderful sun, and they planted right next door in the shade. Of course the butterflies went more to the ones in the sun because they have more nectar, but they still did visit the ones in the shade as well. There's some great nectar plants I'm gonna share with you for even the shade as well. So to have that sunny place is absolutely gonna increase your chances. Okay, then we're gonna have, we have to conduct a survey here. 
It's like, okay, what kind of butterflies do I want? I mentioned two, unless you have mistletoe or you have white cedar swamp, you're probably not going to have in your yard. Oh, I love blue morphos. You know, I went to Callaway and they got beautiful blue morphos, though. I'm not going to get one of those in my yard because they're not even from North America. So these are three fantastic books. This is the one that I had mentioned earlier. As you're going through, what's great about each of, the, each of these is they do list the host plants for each of them as well. So they give you a list. So you do your little survey, you come up with a you know, couple of butterflies that you would love, love to see in your garden. After you've done that survey, we have to start thinking about what can we do then to invite them to come to our garden. As with any wildlife garden, what you want to do is you want to create a very good habitat. And a habitat has to have four components to be healthy. This is for every living thing. Food, water, shelter, space. And so with shelter with butterflies, what you can see here is we have different layers. You can use things like leaves. Butterfly houses are very pretty, but I've never seen a butterfly ever live in one before. <laughs> I have seen wasps move in. And that, you know what, I call garden art. They make nice garden art, because sometimes you want different structures, different textures, and they work well with that. But don't use that just as your butterfly shelter, because not probably going to be the place that they stay. They absolutely love, you know, the, the uh, you know, branches of trees to hang out because you think about it, they're rather small. Big thunderstorm comes in, it's enough to damage or kill a butterfly. So, you, so protection, that's easy. Most of you probably already have that as well. So now we start to talk about some of the flowers that they need. Don't be stingy here. Big, huge masses of color. If you just plant one little flower, one little flower, one little flower, probably not going to come and visit you. Because again, when I, I told you about they can smell nectar, and then when they get on that plant and they taste it, what happens is it really tastes, it has a fantastic nectar taste to it. That proboscis automatically uncurls. It just automatically comes out. So you want the big clusters, and, and another reason you want big clusters is because it's also safety for them. You, you know, there's so many predators that they have that when you provide all of that cluster, you're also giving them a sense of security as well. But you can sit there and see the colors that they, that they enjoy. Now, one of the colors you don't see on there, you don't see a lot, of, you don't see the reds, do you? So we have the purple, the white, the yellows, the blues, and the pinks. Even bees themselves do not see the color red. So our red flowers are, you know, hummingbirds are great, you know, are greatly attracted, or love to be attracted to them. Um, to the red flowers, the flower shape. Think of landing pad. So you have something like, a, let's say, uh, like a, a daisy. We have a daisy, or let's say we could have a um, cone flower. And you think about the shape of it. They're able to land on it. They taste. The proboscis comes out for them. So every every flower that we have has a particular uh, pollinator that will come and visit. Butterflies like landing pads. So we want to also think what's very important, so many times, oh my goodness, spring is here. We are ready to go. We're ready to plant in our gardens, add everything. I can't believe we had a freeze warning. I walked out of my school yesterday to snow flurries. I'm like, what? It was 42 degrees though, so it must have been very cold upper atmosphere. And I'm thinking all the plants that people have already put in their garden to have had that freeze warning last night. But you know what? We do get excited for spring. We the same thing goes for summer, and then towards fall, people get busy. They tend to neglect a lot of their flowers in their gardens at this time of year. I want you to think about the three seasons, and those that even live further south, you probably get a fourth season that I don't get in my part of Georgia. So think about every season gardening for those um, for our for our pollinator friends. Spring, summer, and fall, especially the fall, because so many of them are either going to migrate or they're going to hibernate. So they have to be able to put on the stores that they need to go ahead and um, be able to make it through. These are two fantastic, well aster is a very good one for, for fall. It's one of my favorite ones for the fall. And of course it comes very many different colors as well. Now one thing with butterfly bee, I have noticed, now that one does two, two things. Of course it's a host plant for monarchs and it's also, which is their only host plant, is being um, Asclepius. But it's also a fantastic nectar source as well. Now, Georgia, we have, um, I think we have over 20 different types of uh, milkweed that grow here. There's 45 total in the United States. Many of them are so rare, they're only found in one particular area of one county. 
but there's quite a few choices that are out there. But I have found many times going to, um, I went to a nursery years ago before I taught a workshop, and I wanted to pick up um, milk feed. And when I asked for it, no, we don't, we don't sell that. And as I walked out the door, I turned around, and I asked, oh, do you have asplespias? Oh, yes, we call that butterfly flower. It was all a matter of marketing. Um, so, and it's just like I was, telling, where I was telling someone that I am not good with the Latin name, so everyone that I remember, I'm so excited about. But that's why, because every part of the state, every part of the country, different, you know, different flowers, different plants have different names. So sometimes we have to be careful with what we're asking for. So they did have it, and I was very fortunate to be able to pick some up. Here's some other ones, but you notice all of them with the shapes that they have. All of these make fantastic, fantastic nectar plants, especially in the summertime that we have. So you are planning for clusters. And um, the other thing I was going to say, in my handout, I have all, all the leaves listed here. These are like the top 10. Now, what I love about native plants, of course, is because Georgia butterflies, this is what they're accustomed to. But I'm not a 100% diehard on that because something like lantana also is a good one. Years ago, we used to have butterfly bush listed on there. Georgia Wildlife Federation pulled that one off the list because it became um, what they considered invasive. So they no longer put that on their list. I have one in my yard that I keep track of and, it, and it's um, doing okay. As, there, but, you know, you, as you well know, you just have to be careful with what you put out there. We were talking about one of the other milkweeds um, that many of the, the garden centers will sell. And it is the Cursophica, which is the Mexican milkweed. It is considered annual, but it's not an annual, and it has become invasive. And so I know that one with Monarchs across, across Georgia, we no longer recommend that one because we're trying very hard to keep more towards the native plants and more towards the ones that will not become invasive because you don't know, we don't know what's going to happen you know, with that plant. So many times you don't know the long-term effects of something. Here are a couple others. Joe Pieweed, of course, great, um, you know, uh, fall plant as well. But I did list butterfly bush on here um, in case anybody was interested in putting that in their yard. It is a fantastic nectar source. And then I'm just going, I'm looking at the climb up there. I told you guys I end up talking too much all the time. But I love because a lot of these, like I said, they invite all kinds of pollinators to come to your garden that are here. And don't worry about gardening so neatly. That's the beautiful thing about this type of gardening. The messier it is, actually, the more you will entice to your yard, and it goes back to safety again. You know what, and even leave a portion of your lawn, let the grasses grow up, because many of those grasses, especially the native grasses, are also host plants. Our turf that we put in our, our yards, a lot of that grass, it has no nutritional value for wildlife at all. So if you're really into wildlife gardening or butterfly gardening, you know, start to maybe consider taking out big parts of your lawn and uh, allowing, you know, it to be, become more natural if you're on, um, which is what I've done, but not intentionally, no. <laughs> Just kind of happen. If it's green, it can stay in my yard. That's about to the point where I am. But, you know, things like plantain. Plantain is really good for buckeyes. It's a great host plant for buckeyes. Plus, if you get a bee sting, plantain is a really good plant to go pick and um, crush and put on that bee sting, too. I just let it grow. I have dandelions. I have it all going on. Okay, and here's a couple of other ones. And goldenrod, I hate for people to mistake, um, you know, goldenrod for ragweed because so many times they happen to do that. And if you were to look closely at each of those, ragweed has a flower that is very small. It's very, um, it's a very small flower. It's not as brightly colored because it's wind pollinated. Goldenrod, on the other hand, has a larger bloom and is a brighter color to attract pollinators. It just so happens they both bloom at the same time because people will see this and say, I don't want that in my yard. That's the stuff that gives me out, you know, causes all the allergies. No, it's the ragweed that causes all the allergies, not the goldenrod that's doing it. Goldenrod is actually very good. So here's the difference between the two. Can you even tell how she's holding them? You can barely see the blooms in her, um, in her right hand. Am I on the right side. I hate when I have to turn around this way. But you can see what I tell people is I drive down the road and I'm looking. I'm like, whoo, brightly colored, not brightly colored, brightly colored. And I can tell that way just by driving down the road, just looking, because that's how obvious the color difference is in the two. Now, I told you I'd give you a couple of shade. Anybody here have a shady place? I need some love. Oh, yes. 
you know what, I, I love jewelweed, of course. And, um, you know, jewelweed is a member of the impatient family. Fantastic if you have, it usually grows around where there's poison ivy because, you know, it's one of the remedies for poison ivy, too. You take the leaves on that, you get poison ivy, you rub it on there as well. And, um, but you know what, be careful, of course, we know with our mints, don't we, what happens. You, uh, so many times what I've done in years past is when I do plant mint, I plant it in a larger container that I then plant in the ground, but I don't completely submerge it under the ground. But then I, you have to be careful because it will spread. But you know what? I have some that is spread, and when I cut the grass, you get that lovely smell too. Like I tell you, if it's green, it can grow my yard. So here's some fantastic choices for your garden. And then I do a whole class that's just on nighttime pollinator gard, uh, gardening because there's so many fantastic things you can do with that. It's all about your senses. So these nighttime flowers are extremely fragrant. Now this is if you want to get on the side of bringing the moths to your garden at night. All of these will attract moths to your gardens. And uh, annual trumpets, so if you have very small children around, it is a, a, it is a poisonous plant. And I know the kids a lot of times like to play with it because it looks so cool, which it does, but it is one. So just be careful about that one. So we have our nectar plants for the adults, but now you have to think about your host plants because as you're creating these gardens, you want everybody to come and visit and, uh, and, and stay for a while. So violets, fantastic shade choice. Again, if you need a host plant, you have a shady place, plant some of those violets in there. I mentioned plantain earlier. That's a very good one for, um, for buckeyes. And of course, oh, I love passion flowers. Now, what happened, a friend of mine had a, a tree in her backyard that had rotted and, and, and the top part of it had blown over. Instead of her cut, completely cutting it down to the ground, she allowed, uh, she topped the tree so um, it was probably about 15 feet high. She just planted her passion flower, her passion vine all over it and ended up with a gorgeous centerpiece in the middle of her yard instead of completely taking out that tree. But everybody needs to remember that for every quarter acre you have, you need to have at least one dead log or snag there. Over 400 different species will utilize that dead tree. So it's always good to have one. You know, that part of your property or something is always a good place for it. I also tell people with wildlife gardening, many times it's very important.